And welcome to another edition of IGL Weekly presented by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Give them a call at 1-800-TV-RADIO or log on to GoCSB.com. We're tomorrow's broadcasters today alongside Johnny V. I'm Sean Brown. Week number two of the IGL is in the books. Yes, sir. Glad to be back, Sean. Another exciting week of football here in spring. Let's talk about it, man. Coming up on the big show, we'll have all the action from week number two in the IGL. Plus, we'll have a stats breakdown of each game and our players of the week. Plus, we'll have an interview, an exclusive CSB interview, with the IGL commissioner and the head coach of the Pro Stars, Adam Turkle. But we begin as we head to the Pineland Sports Complex. We go right back there for another exciting Saturday of football. Yep, and we have our first matchup between the Conshohock and Steelers and the Mustangs, both teams coming in with a 1-0 record. That's absolutely right. This was our game to watch coming into this week. And not the start we wanted, but this game delivered, I thought, on entertainment value alone. Absolutely. So, um, you know, before the game even started, we have one interesting note to share with our listeners. Uh, the head coach, Henry Rasich of the Steelers, and Coach O'Branty of the Mustangs played some ball together back in the day. Yes, Coach Lorenzo Brandy talked about they had a little bit of a rivalry in between uh, the coaching staff, so that would uh, be a nice little storyline coming into this one. Absolutely. We also have an intriguing quarterback matchup, two of the premier quarterbacks in the IGL, Jerry Davis and Tyreek Smith. This should be a good one. It's set up to be, and, it, and like I said earlier, it delivered. So let's dive right on into this thing. So one of the interesting things, uh, the Steelers, they weren't wearing their usual uniforms in this game. No, they were paying homage to the 2014 Philadelphia Hawks. Uh, they were wearing the Hawks jerseys. Uh, those Hawks were the champions of the IGL that year. So a uh, little shout out to them. Yeah. Now, as we get into the game action, we noticed it looked like the Mustangs were having some problems with the snaps in the first quarter. The very first, uh, very first snap of their game goes right over the quarterback's head, rolls 25 yards into the end zone, recovered by number 52 uh, for the touchdown, and the Steelers slash Hawks take the first, <laughs> uh, take the opening lead, and uh, they didn't look back. They they kept adding on to that, uh, and it all started with. Our man, quarterback Jerry Davis. Yeah, and he got into action early, receiving touchdown to number three, Sean Porter for the Steelers as they get right back on the scoreboard. And then right after that, he added a quarterback sneak of his own. Listen, not to take anything away from the Mustangs here, their pass rush was fierce. They were coming at him, but they ran into a problem, and his name was Jerry Davis. I mean, this guy was a video game character out there. Difficult to contain. They were in the backfield, but he's just so elusive. Couldn't and lay a finger on him. They just couldn't get their hands on him. And, and then he made the uh, pass at the end of it, that five passing touchdowns in total. Yeah, so the Stangs defense was, was definitely penetrating in the backfield. But as you say, Jerry Davis couldn't be contain, contained in this one. Uh, the last play before the half, Malik Jackson with a 40-yard receiving touchdown. Yeah, and it really saved them and put uh, the Mustangs right back in this game. It was the last play of the half, a bobbled play. He ends up with the catch. And they go in with a little momentum into halftime. Yeah, so going fast-forwarding now to the second half, quarterback Tyreek starts the second half with the scoring with a 10-yard quarterback keeper for the Mustangs. That's right, and then you started to feel the energy coming back into the room. Can here. they complete that comeback, Johnny? Uh, it's, you know, they got it together. Their offense started picking it up, but they just could not stop Jerry every Davis. Every time, every time they looked like they had something going, it looks like the Steelers... Counter. And they got it Answered done in right other back. ways. Good kick returns, good offensive plays, running the football. I mean, they just had an answer for everything. But back come the Mustangs again. Malik Jackson with his second receiving touchdown, and we're on the seesaw, Johnny. And, and at this point, it was, it was a heavyweight fight in the second half, just punch after punch for these teams. Uh, it's unfortunate they couldn't get over the 24 nothing deficit from the first half. Back come the Steelers' passing game, which was – Awesome in this game. Again, we see a touchdown. This time, it's Todd Wilson for the reception. And Todd Wilson was the kick returner who was doing all the damage on special teams as well as offense. The Steelers really had the passing game going in this game compared to their first week matchup where it was more their defense. They, did, they really they, had the offense going this week. That was one of the interesting things I found. I, I thought the Steelers would come and be in a defensive team, win with smash-mouth football. But now this time, they did it through the air. They did it through finesse. 
it shows they're a versatile team. They can do it in different ways. We fast forward to the final frame. Vince, how do you say that last name? Pagion? Uh, he may or may not be Italian. He, he's definitely Italian. Receiving touchdown for the Mustangs, that cuts the lead to 36-27. You had a glimmer of hope there, but... Every time. Every single time, the Steelers just had an answer. A touchdown to number five. Uh, the two-point no good pushes the score to 42-27. That was the dagger. That would have been the dagger. Uh, number 11, Malik Jackson, who was wearing number 34 in this one, uh, added another touchdown to bring the Steelers close, or bring the Mustangs closer, but it just wasn't enough. You can't get over a 24 0 uh, deficit. Yeah, they got themselves in trouble uh, with the early deficit. It they was did. too much in the end. Our final score: Steelers 42. They go to 2 and 0 on the season. The Mustangs drop to 1 and 1. They had 33 points. 42, 33. Steelers win. Um, last week we mentioned the Steelers did it with the steel curtain defense, and this week. They put some points on the board. Sean, there's a day I want to point to on the calendar, and that's May 7th. This game happens again. Hey, don't count the Mustangs out. They know they can hang with this team. They saw it in the second half. I'm excited for that game. I can't wait for May 7th, CSB's matchup of the week, as the teams will square off again. All right, right now let's go to CSB's Jared Steckler as he's with the Steelers head coach as he gives his recipe on what it takes to get to the championship. I'm here with Coach Henry Rasich of the 2-0 and o Steelers. Uh, how did you guys get off to this such a hot start? I don't know. We're lucky. No, I'm just kidding. No, we, uh, we had a hot start um, unbelievably because we didn't even practice this week. I never know what I'm going to get with these guys. But uh, I saw a lot of things I liked, a lot of things I didn't like. When you're playing a quarterback like Tyreek Smith, it doesn't matter what defense you draw up. He's going to break it down. He's just an athlete. He's like our version of Michael Vick in the IGL. But uh, he just got to sustain his storm and, and play sound ball everywhere else. So it seemed as if last week was a lot about defense. This week was a little bit more about offense. Was that just coincidence? Was it the team you're playing? What goes into that? It's, it has a lot to do with the team we're playing. Uh, the Mustangs are a very uh, veteran coaching staff. I know Lorenzo. Lorenzo and I actually played semi-pro ball together on the country Steelers 100 years ago. But they're a well-coached team. Uh, the Vikings, not to say they're not well-coached, they're just new to arena football. And you can tell. You can tell the guys have been around the block a little bit. You're getting tight ends involved, running backs. It's a whole nother level once you know what you're doing. And that's a big advantage. Well, along the lines of what you just said, it does seem like the uh, Steelers, your team, have a lot of chemistry. I guess it's a product of being together for a long time. Do you notice that? Does it seem like it's stronger this year than ever? Uh, most definitely. This year there's, we have a nice core group of guys. I think I stood up 12 guys last week. They're the same guys that are usually at practice all the time. They travel together. It's a much closer team, and that's the kind of team, that's a team that ends up winning championships. So what are you guys going to look for? Uh, what are you going to try to continue to do to keep this momentum going? Just get better, play sound ball. We had a couple of defensive breakdowns that I wasn't happy about. You know, I said, this guy Tyree's going to run around all day. Don't get mesmerized by him and watch him in the backfield. And someone's running behind you. That happened several times. Uh, we had him shut out for a while. That one little tip that ended up with a score, I said, that's how an avalanche starts. That's how they start putting points on the board. So we have a lot of work to do. I mean, we're, we're far from perfect. We're 2-0 on the, you know, in our roster and our schedule. But we have a lot of work, in my mind. Was there any specific message you had for the team after the game? Get the practice, first of all, because we didn't get a practice this week, which is disgusting. Um, but, no, that's it. Like, just keep doing what we're doing. We're going to get better. We have an old group with a new group of guys starting to gel a little bit. So we'll get better every week. There's no doubt in my mind. No doubt about it, Johnny. Chemistry is an important ingredient to team success. And in every aspect of life, really. No question about it. All right, let's throw it to our colleague here at CSBIGL Weekly, Matt Rabbit with the stats. Thanks to everybody joining me here for another edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I'm Matt Rabbit, bringing you the key stats for IGL Weekly. This is week two. Let's get to the stats. Starting off with the Mustangs offense, number one quarterback Tyreek Smith had a total of four passing touchdowns and one rushing touchdown for 10 yards, giving him a total of 165 passing yards and 45 yards rushing on the ground. One of those touchdowns were caught by number 27, Vince P, who ended the game with two catches and 30 yards. Now the other three touchdowns were caught by number 11, Malik Jackson. He had 110 yards on only five catches. Moving over to the defensive side, 
the Mustangs defense totaled 12 tackles in the entire game, which were led by number 30, Duke Chilton, who had two tackles and one fumble recovery. His teammate, number 34, Howard Edwards, had the only sack on a very mobile quarterback for the Steelers. Moving over to the Steelers' defense, who on the very first play had a fumble recovery taken back to the house to give them their first touchdown of the game. Number four, Christian McCourty, was the one who scored that touchdown. Other notable player, number 19, Tim Young, who led the team with four tackles and, only, and the only sack the entire game. The defense had a total of three turnovers. On the offensive side of the ball, quarterback Jerry Davis throwing four TDs to three different wide receivers. Number three, Sean Porter, was the recipient of two of those touchdowns with 60 yards on three catches. Quarterback Davis showed he's not just a mobile quarterback and is able to get it done through the air, giving him a total of 158 yards passing. There's no doubt in my mind that the three phases in the game for the Steelers was a team effort in getting the second win of the season. Now back to you guys at the main desk. All right, stay tuned because when we return here on IGL Weekly, we'll be joined by the IGL commissioner and the head coach of the IGL Pro Stars, Adam Turkle, will join us on the phone lines as CSB's IGL Weekly rolls on right after this. So you've been thinking about changing careers. Well, now is the perfect time to check out Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Discover the exciting world of audio and video production. They have a campus right here in Cherry Hill. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or visit GoCSB.com. And welcome back to CSB's IGL Weekly. Earlier, Johnny and I had the privilege to talk to the IGL commissioner and the head coach of the Pro Stars. We want to find a little bit more about that. So right now, let's go to that interview. All right, on the phone right now, we have the commissioner of the IGL, who is also the head coach of the IGL Pro Stars. Coach Adam Turkle joins us on the CSB phone line. Coach Turk, how are you? Sean Brown and Johnny uh, V. I'm doing well. How are you guys, Sean and Johnny? A pleasure to be on the show with you. Hey, how's it going, Coach? Good to talk to you. We appreciate you taking a couple minutes out of your busy schedule. Coach Turk, you know, CSB is thrilled to renew its partnership with the IGL Coach, this brings back very fond memories of 2013. Absolutely. 2013 was, was the foundation that when I was with the Bulldogs built with that organization, and now we've tried to turn over that same type of philosophy, football business philosophy, on a league level to create what we are now in the process of creating, and the progress of it is pretty impressive, Sean. So, Coach, uh, how does it feel just watching these guys try to fulfill their dreams? You know, I can kind of see it in their eyes when I'm there on the field. That they're really trying. They're, this is their shot. Yeah, I, listen, it, it is a big shot for people. It's a second-chance program. You don't have many second-chance programs around. A lot of guys, when they're younger, if their high school career comes to an end or their college career comes to an end, or even the percentage of college players that even make it to the pros is so small that that's usually where the dream dies. But fortunately, with the way that this has been assembled, the dream doesn't have to die. There's the ability to still build that film, still be seen, make your way into the arena league, and anything can happen from there. Uh, you know, every football fan in the world knows the Kurt Warner story. Talking to IGL Pro Stars head coach Adam Turkle. Coach, talk to us about some of the players on the Pro Stars. We're hearing that you have some of the past stars from the New Jersey Bulldogs. Is that true? Of course, that's true, Sean. I mean, you know, there's guys that, that I believe in that were able to help us in, in the way we operated back then that I knew then had potential and the ability to play pro ball. So, yeah, you're going to see a, a Mike Merritt, a QB MJM, and doing his thing uh, for the Pro Stars, and you're going to see the created player, John Thomas, catching some of them touchdowns. And we have a lot of good IGL players on this team, a lot of guys that I've coached against in the IGL that I've seen go through the IGL system, um, guys that, that I've known of and just really haven't gotten as much of that opportunity. And it, it is an honor to coach these guys. These guys are working so hard right now. Is that going to help you having a quarterback you're familiar with? Oh, absolutely. You know, it only it cuts the, the learning curve and teaching curve in half. It's almost like having another offensive coach out there who understands the language. And Mike has been around the game a long time. He, he's been in the pros before. Uh, he still, to this day, throws one of the prettiest footballs I've ever seen in my life. And having him on the field, helping to guide these young guys especially, is really quite an advantage. So, Coach, uh, 
they say football teams take after their head coach. They're molded into kind of their head coach. Who are you trying to mold the pro stars into? We're going to be a physically tough, high energy, and strong in the fourth quarter team. I believe in stamina and endurance. If you're in the game in the fourth quarter and you're the team that's in better physical shape and better win, you're going to wear them down. You're going to win the game. So if you want to know what a Turk-type team is, a Turk-type team is, is a tough team that at the end of the game gets three times as tough. So, Coach, players like Tim Young play for the IGL and also play for you. How do they balance both of those things? Are they kind of worn out from the IGL schedule when, when you get them? Do you wear them out for the rest of their IGL schedule? How does that work in between leagues? No. Well, the way, the way it's designed right now is every player on the Pro Stars is an IGL player. Um, they're all you know, registered within the IGL by, by their teams that they're drafted or assigned to. And the Pro Stars, the difference between the Pro Stars and a team like the Philadelphia Yellow Jackets is, is we're an independent team. We play an independent schedule. So our schedule is only going to be five games. It's going to be five home games. The IGL, however, has eight games and has a postseason. So since these players are, are an all-star team of the IGL, the weeks that the Pro Stars don't play, they play with their IGL teams. The weeks the Pro Stars do play, they play for the Pro Stars. And that's also challenging for their teams. Their teams have to, have to get through, you know, five weeks of their eight weeks without some of their best players. But this also makes these players eligible for the playoffs. And the level of competition they're going to face on the professional level, is going to be stiffer. And when they get to the playoffs with their IGL teams, they're going to be rip-roaring ready to go. So there's no conflict as in a player plays for two teams in one day. I don't think that's physically wise. You're risking somebody's injury there. And my always my first concern, my first worry is a player's health. That comes before anything. All right, Coach, we really appreciate a few minutes of your time. Thanks so much for coming in, and we'll look forward to talking to you as the season rolls on. Thanks, Coach. Oh, it's never a trouble to give you guys my time. You guys are the best. I'm big fans, and... We love what CSB does and, and the whole reuniting of CSB and the IGL and now the addition of the Pro Stars to go with it. Thank you, uh, CSB, for doing what they do. Thank you to the Philadelphia Yellow Jackets for giving us all the opportunity to be part of this big project. And uh, I think 2016 is going to be a great year for all of the above. All right, Coach Adam Turkle of the IGL Pro Stars and the commissioner of the IGL, thanks so much for joining us. That was Adam Turkel, and his pro stars will take the field next week. I'm excited to see him. I'm excited for their debut as well. One thing I can tell you about Coach Turk, he's a fiery guy, and he breathes football, so his team will be well-prepared and ready to go. I can promise you that. Absolutely. He's a character, man. All right, so let's jump into uh, game number two on the docket. It is the battle of the winless teams. We've got the Revolution and the Fury, both teams starting at 0-1. And neither team wants to go 0-2. It could really impact their playoff chances. You're absolutely right, Sean. Some team is going to get their season back on track this week. And to me, this one was won before the kickoff. So the Revolution uh, huddling multiple times before the kickoffs. Tell us what this was about, Johnny. During drills, you know, I, I saw them huddle about three times before the kickoff. Uh, you know, Coach Carr preaches unity. He preaches teamwork. And the last time we saw this team, they were under the scoreboard after being blanked in an opening day shutout. And listen, I guess he laid into him, but whatever his message was, it got through to the guys. They obviously put in a good week of practice, and they came out ready for this one. Yeah, nobody wants to be embarrassed. Nobody no, wants to be embarrassed. Not. So apparently they got the message, perhaps Coach Carr instilling some discipline into yes. his team. All right, so we move forward with this game. So the Revolution players seem more calm in this game and more poised, but the Fury players seem to be absolutely furious. What was going on? What were they frustrated about, Johnny? They were. There was some questionable calls, some questionable no calls, uh, a little bit of holding. Listen, the game wasn't officiated as fairly as it could have been. But you hate to blame things on the officiating. But at the same time, the Fury, the quarterback play wasn't great. Okay. Yeah, you know I mean, the, 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 defense, the defense played well, but the Revolution made plays. Okay, they, they came out, they were ready for this one, they were poised. Did you get the impression that uh, the frustration affected their performance? By the middle of the game, absolutely. Uh, and, and when it got to that point at halftime, we saw a very controversial play mm -hmm. where it's the last play of the half. 12-0 revolution at this point. 12-0 revolution at this point, a two-touchdown lead. You get in the end zone here and you're right back in the game. Yep. We have a catch where the player was out of bounds, had one foot in bounds, the officials say no touchdown. Did they get it right? I believe so. The explanation I got from the official 
sounded like they made the right call, okay. but you could not get the fury to calm down after that. Yelling at each other, yelling at teammates, coaches yelling at each other, it boiled over in this one. Okay, all right, so at halftime, we had a quarterback change for the fury. What prompted that change? I think it was just performance. I think you're just trying to spark your team, trying to try something different to see if it works. Unfortunately, it worked yeah. much like it did last week. So Matt Wood comes into the game for the Fury, and he threw it to the wrong team. He did, and that goes for six, making the score 18 nothing. And, I mean, a team that's already frustrated now is facing an 18 nothing deficit. So the second half was all about the defense and each team making mistakes. That's right. We're looking at one, two, three, four, five, six turnovers between the two teams in the second half alone. Uh, sloppy play. But give credit to the defenses. This was something I wasn't expecting in the arena game for the defenses to be as great right. as they have been. Absolutely. Final score, 18-8. to The Revolution pick up their first win of the season to go to 1-1 one one in the Fury, fall to 0-2. What do you say we go to CSB's Rebecca Bookbinder talking to Bradley Davis, number 20 of the Revolution on the game? Hi, my name is Rebecca Bookbinder for CSB Sports, and I'm here with number 20 of the Philadelphia Revolution, Bradley Davis. Bradley, you put in quite a bit of work for today's game. What was going through your mind? Yeah, I just wanted to play ball. It's like coming out here, I had like a jolt coming up, like, all right, I want to hit somebody, I want to hit somebody. But then it's like, all right, I want to get in, I need to score, I need to score. And I promised the guy 60 points the first half. I mean, we came up short, but, I mean, it happens. Next game. You guys suffered a tough loss last week. What was something that you focused on in practice to try to change the outcome? Um, getting the guys out here, getting the guys out. Uh, we were missing a few pieces last week. I know I missed last game. Uh, we had like two or three others missed last game. But that's, that's, that's it, just getting the guys. We, have, uh, we had more guys out this week, and hopefully we get everyone next week. Thank you, Bradley. Good luck next week. For CSP Sports, I'm Rebecca Bookbinder. Thanks, guys. Now here's the stats from Game 2. Starting off with the Revolution, quarterback number 16, Chris Pollard, went 5 for 13 with 65 yards and one touchdown. Number 2, Stephen Elliott, had two interceptions with three tackles. Number 6, Earl Stewart, had seven tackles for one interception that he returned for a touchdown. Number 20, Bradley Davis, had two receptions for 25 yards and one TD. They also tried him out on defense, and he came up with two sacks. Moving on to the Fury, quarterback number five, Doris Atkins, went six for 15, 84 yards in the air, and one rushing TD. Number 27, Curtis Smith, had one forced fumble and also recovered the fumble. And then Clifford Paytner had also one forced fumble that he decided to recover himself. That's it for the stats from game two. Now back to you guys at the main desk. We have to go to break, but when CSB's IGL Weekly continues, we will have the highlights between the Nightmare and the Vikings, and we'll also have our Players of the Week as IGL Weekly continues right after this. So you've been thinking about changing careers. Well, now is the perfect time to check out Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Almost everything you hear on the radio, everything you see on television and on the Internet was made by a creative team of audio and video professionals. Connecticut School of Broadcasting can help you switch from your current career path to the more exciting world of audio and video production. Come in and see what a career in broadcasting is like and see if it's right for you. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has a campus right here in Cherry Hill. Call 1-800-TV-RADIO or visit GoCSB.com. And we welcome you back to CSB's IGL Weekly alongside Johnny. I'm Sean, and we get into our third game of the week in the IGL between the 1-0 New Jersey Nightmare and the 0-1 Vikings. And the big storyline in this game, Johnny, is the debut of their quarterback, Omar Kingwood, to the Vikings. This should definitely give them a big boost. Oh, man, the only thing that was the same about this Vikings team and last week's Vikings team was the jersey, Sean. I mean, you could, you, could, you could imagine there was different guys in the shirts. It was night and day, the difference. Yeah, no question about it. And 
the, the significance of the quarterback position in, in general in football is so crucial and so important. I think it's the most important position in all of sports. You hear it all the time. You do. Your quarterback is your general, your field leader. And, and in my opinion, your quarterback, if you don't have a quarterback that is an efficient franchise type quarterback, it's, it's really difficult to win a title in any level of football unless you have a very elite it's defense. It's difficult to even look like a professional team or some of a professional team. I mean, yep. I, I don't want to call it incompetence because the guy never did it last week, but they couldn't get a snap down, you know what I mean? And it's impossible to run an offense like that. So adding in a quarterback just changes the whole perception of this team. I, I think this is a team on the up. There's no question about it, and I think I used the word last week, anemic offense with yes. the Vikings. Yes. We didn't see that in week two. No. They looked more like an indoor offense, and night and day compared to last week, Johnny. Absolutely, but uh, oddly enough, one of my big matchups was on the defensive side for the Vikings. Right. Uh, number 25, Thomas Odom, cornerback, and number 88, Joey Ramirez, the safety, did a great job keeping Dijon Thomas, a star that we've built up, in check. Uh, listen, he got his because he's a good player, but I have to credit Thomas Odom and Joey Ramirez on the job that they did keeping Dijon in check. Yeah, you know, he only had three receptions in this game for 54 exactly. yards and a touchdown. That's not a bad day at the office. It's not. But I've seen Dijon play in the past, and he is an absolute nightmare for a lot of opposing team secondary. So I'd say they did a good job keeping him in check. He did. And, and like I said, he got his. He got his big catch and run. But great players make great plays. So we noticed with the Vikings offense, two timeouts in the first 15 minutes of the game. Why was this? Was there some rust? I think, I think it was more just trying to acclimate the quarterback to the speed of the game, yeah. just make sure he's mentally, you know, thinking yeah. the right thing, seeing the same thing the coaches. They seeing. were trying to get Omar uh, acclimated. Yeah, exactly. All right, so uh, we're going to definitely move on. The big matchup, as you pointed out, Odom versus Dijon Thomas. We mentioned that Odom did a good job keeping him in check in the first quarter, but in the second quarter, Dijon Thomas got on the scoreboard for the New Jersey Nightmare. He did, and it was a great pass by quarterback Josh Henshaw over the shoulder. Good body positioning by Dijon and took it to the house. And this but was the start of a frenzy of scoring in big plays. It, it was because right after that, we got a long 40-yard touchdown uh, by the Vikings to tie the game back up. Rashawn Cooper. Rashawn Cooper. And uh, that's when we had the game's most exciting play. A guy that I am just absolutely falling in love with uh -oh. after these two games. You got man. a man crush, don't you? I do a little you bit. You got a Number man crush. Number three of the New Jersey Nightmare, Stephen Fortune. This dude gets it done on offense, defense, special teams. And he looked at our boy Dijon and said, hey, I'm taking this one to the crib. And guess what? He delivered 50 yards to the house. Kickoff return touchdown to make the score 12-6 or right yeah, before Yes, he did, and we will have more on him coming up a little Absolutely. bit later as well. All right, so at halftime, 12-6, the nightmare lead, and what was kind of a nail-biter up until that point. It was. Uh, like I said, the Vikings defense held this game in check. Uh, we saw the nightmare run it up last, last week, and that was not the case this time. This was a nail-biter. All right, so the game settled down early in the second half until a big play to number one, Travis Davis. Yeah, so contested catch. He goes up. Uh, fights for the ball from the defense, uh, gets a few extra yards, goes down, and sets up what ends up being the game-winning touchdown. Yeah, he made a big play there. So uh, he set up the rushing touchdown by quarterback Henshaw, which pretty much put the nail in the coffin. Uh, then they would add another score later. Final score, Nightmare 26, Vikings 6. Was the score really a, a true indicator of this game? I don't think so. I think I the think Vikings so. are a team that is really just getting itself together. They're coming in from the outdoor game. They're learning a whole, it is really a whole new game. I mean, football is football, right. but there are nuances that take some time to get used to. And you mentioned time. The key word in there is timing because timing. they're getting acclimated to that indoor game. And in the indoor game, it's all about timing on offense. Exactly. And the penalty numbers were staggering. Uh, we had, what was it, nine penalties and seven of them are uh, false start penalties on the motion. No question. Uh, that's, that's. It's hard to get your offense off the ground when you're constantly moving backwards. So the New Jersey Nightmare is still perfect, 2-0 and on the season. The Vikings drop to 0-2, but they're looking like they're on the up and up. Yes, I, I think this is a team with a brighter future than an 0-2 record indicates. All right, let's wrap this one up with some stats.
Thanks guys, and now it's time for stats from Game 3. Starting off with the Vikings, number 16 quarterback Omar Kingwood went 4 for 9 with 75 yards and one touchdown. Number 4, Rashawn Cooper, had one reception for 40 yards that led to a touchdown. Now they had trouble getting their timing down, which led to nine offensive penalties, seven of those being false starts. So that's definitely something the team needs to work on for next week. On the defensive side, number 51, Arnell Smith, came away with one interception. Moving over to the nightmare stats, number four, quarterback Josh Henshaw went eight for 21 with two touchdowns. Number 14, Deshaun Thomas, had three catches for 54 yards, also with a touchdown. And number one, Travis Davis, two receptions, 33 yards receiving, four rushes for 32 yards and a touchdown. Number three, Jared Sampson led the defense with two tackles, two sacks and one interception. My player of the game is number 23, Stephen Fortune, who had a kick return for a TD late in the second quarter to go along with his two interceptions. That's all the time for me this week. I'm Matt Rabbit, your IGL stat man. Now we're going to kick it back to Sean for his player of the week. All right, my offensive player of the week is number 24, quarterback of the Conshohocken Steelers, Jerry Davis. Impressive day, 10 of 18 passing for 158 yards and five total touchdowns. Here's a guy that's probably going to be involved in conversation for the MVP of the IGL later in the season. Let's see what he had to say. I'm here with Jerry Davis, the quarterback of the winning 2-0 Steelers now. Finish 10 for 18, 158 yards and five touchdown passes. How were you able to be so effective today? I mean, five touchdowns. It looked like you were finding your guys. When you wanted to make the pass, you made the pass. Yeah, um, great line, and they know how to just, just give me time back there, and uh, my guys just continue to get open. If the first play is not there, it's football. You got, you got to scramble around. You got to get uh, the play downfield and just find somebody who's open, so we did that. What did you think about the team's overall performance this week compared to last week's? This was a dog fight. This was a fight. That's a great team over there, the Mustangs. Uh, I'd appreciate playing them every week just because they're fight, they're dogs, they love to hit, they come up at you, and that's the kind of game we like to play. If you don't appreciate football, you don't belong out here, so... Great job by them, uh, but it was just a, just a great game. It was fun. I know you play cornerback as well, so being on both sides of the ball, is it tough to stay sharp? I know you could scramble and all that, so you, you're moving constantly. Yeah, well, absolutely. Uh, they, they had a couple where they beat me deep. Uh, some good receivers over there. So you just got to gotta be in shape. You, you got to know your coverages on both sides of the ball. Uh, arena football, that, that, that's what they play. You see a lot of guys go both ways. That's what it is out here. So try to do my best, uh, but this team, we're united, man. We're together, and even if we – go down or, or they get an opportunity to score, we're coming back and we're sticking together. Sure. And that's two, the two most demanding positions possibly. So I know there was one particular play at the end with the running back. It kind of iced the game. Can you talk about that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Cameron LaSalle, our running back, he, he'll pound the ball. He'll kill you up the middle. Uh, but if he goes out from that backfield, he'll go get it too. I just had to trust him on that play. He wasn't uh, super open, but I knew if that ball was in the air and towards him, he'll go and get it. And sure enough, he did. And, uh, you'll see it on the highlights on the film. That was a fantastic catch. And he came down. Touchdown. Absolutely. You guys look great out there. Congratulations. Appreciate I'm Jared Stackle with CSB. And my defensive player of the week, number 23 of New Jersey Nightmare, Stephen Fortune, defensive back. Two interceptions this week and added in a kickoff return for a score. This guy does it all, including an interview with our Juan Perez Jr. Mr. Stephen Fortune of the Jersey Nightmare. How you doing today? I'm doing good. Pretty good. Yeah, I saw you working real hard on the squad today. Yes? Yes. Very good. You had one tackle and two interceptions today. Now, how did that feel? I feel, feel, just feel I'm blessed to be here. Good. feel good. Yeah, that's excellent. That's actually also we're screaming and hollering off the sideline on trying to get a 50-yard return. How'd that work out for you? Yeah, I just, I'm just blessed. It's good. I, I got vision. I got talent. There you go. Excellent. Excellent. So how does it feel playing with the squad this year? I mean, it feels good. First time playing with them, but we come, coming together, working as a team, just trying to get wins. Excellent. Excellent. This has been Juan Perez, Jr. with CSB Sports. All right, and that's a wrap for week two of the IGL, Johnny. Another one in the books. You got it. All right, for Johnny V and the entire CSB IGL Weekly crew, I'm Sean Brown. We'll see you next time right here on the Connecticut School of Broadcasting presents IGL Weekly. So long, everybody.